now we have Vladislav uh, Taranchuk from the University of Delaware, who will be speaking on the existence of Pappas configurations in projective planes. Take it away, Vladislav. Okay, thank you. Um, one second, let me get the uh, laser pointer if I can find it. Uh, there. You guys see the laser pointer? Yes. Okay. Alrighty. Um, yes. Thank you uh, for coming um, to the last talk, I believe, um, of the conference. Um, so I'll be talking on the existence of Pappus configurations in uh, projective planes. So to start off, we'll want to define uh, what a projective plane is. So a projective plane is just an incident structure of points and lines, uh, and together with an incidence relation uh, for the set of points and the set of lines that uh, satisfies the following three axioms. So you wanna make sure that any two points uh, lie on some unique line. So there should be some unique line running through them. And in a dual sort of sense, any two lines should intersect in exactly one point. So axiom two here kind of eliminates the possibility of anything being parallel. Um, and finally, uh, to eliminate some degenerate cases, you'll wanna make sure you have at least four points, no three of which are collinear. Uh, so just some quick facts. If pi is finite, uh, which is the most interesting case to me, uh, at least. So if you have a finite projective plane, then you will have some positive integer n so that every single line will contain exactly n plus one points. Every uh, point will lie on n plus one lines. And so again, you see sort of this duality here um, and you'll have that uh, the number of points is equal to the number of lines, which is in total n squared plus n plus one. So as a quick example, um, so the following construction is what's known as a classical uh, projective plane and it can be built over any field. Um, so in terms of visualization, I kind of have this picture on the right here. You can think of R3, uh, this you know, standard three-dimensional Euclidean plane. That is the easiest way I think to visualize what's going on. Uh, but generally speaking, we just build these over uh, vector spaces or use vector spaces over uh, the field and the field can be finite again or infinite. So um, the set of points, in this vector space uh, will correlate to all one dimensional subspaces. Uh, so all lines in the vector space will correlate to the set of points um, in our projective plane. The set of lines in the projective plane will relate to all two dimensional subspaces of, our, of F3, so all planes. Um, so you can see there's sort of a downshift in terms of um, uh, degree, right? So you have a line goes to a point, a plane goes to a uh, line in the, in the projective plane. And in fact, you can extend this for projective spaces, which we won't be getting into here. So uh, I, the incidence relation between the points and lines, or rather the uh, one dimensional subspaces and the two dimensional subspaces in F3 can be uh, just naturally defined using subset subspace containment. So if we wanted to think of this over R, just take the origin. Um, every line through the origin will be a point in the space. Every point, um, every plane through the origin uh, will be a line in the projective plane. And to quickly verify the axioms, right? If you have two lines, say the y-axis and the x-axis, well, they define this blue plane Q, uh, Q, right? And a plane corresponds to a line. So we have two lines, which are points in the projective plane define a unique line in the projective plane. And likewise, if you have two planes, say the red and the blue one here, um, then they intersect at a unique line and a line corresponds to a point. So you kind of have the verification of your axioms. Uh, there are plenty of other ways of constructing these and it really would have been easier to start off with say defining an affine plane, but for the sake of time, we'll have to stick with uh, just projective planes. Um, and so the biggest question in this area is the following. Uh, so for which positive integers n does there exist a projective plane of order n? 
Uh, so this question, um, answering it like completely would have implications to um, combinatorial number theory, uh, determining um, perfect different sets and what orders they can have, as well as various Turan type problems in graph theory. So this implications of solving this would be um, very, very um, large. Uh, so in that um, same strain, uh, the most celebrated theorem um, in this area, pushing towards trying to understand this question is the Brookreiser theorem, which tells us uh, that for every finite projective plane of order n, if n happens to be congruent to one or two mod four, uh, then uh, there cannot exist a projective plane of order n unless you can express it as a tough sum of two square integers. So this comes about from mixing some linear algebra with some fairly intense number theoretic results. Um, but this is the best we have in terms of excluding, say, an infinite amount of possible values of n for which you can have a projective plane. And really the conjecture, which we're very, very far from answering, is uh, that projective planes only exist for um, orders of, of prime power. And to relate back to the construction above, um, right, so finite fields exist of every prime power order, so you can construct a projective plane of every possible prime power order. Um, and as well as we have plenty of constructions of prime power order uh, planes that are actually not isomorphic to the classical ones. Uh, however, there do not exist any known um, non-prime power order constructions. Uh, and another uh, big conjecture in the area is that every finite projective plane of prime order is in fact classical. So this one's a little more iffy in terms of the consensus within the community, but um, all of these have very, again, powerful implications to various different areas of math. Okay, so uh, configurations. Um, so a configuration within a projective plane is just a finite collection of points and lines. Um, and some configurations are more important than others. Uh, so there's a question in the chat uh, that I see. So class, what does classical mean? Um, classical is just the definition really given for um, let me this specific construction. So building a projective plane over a field, we call it that uh, projective plane cla uh, classical. Um, because you can have different projective planes of the same size that are not isomorphic. So classical is just a way of kind of saying here is a standard construction of a projective plane. Okay, uh, I hope that answered the question. Um, so um, in a configuration, again, in a projective plane will just be a collection, finite collection of points and lines. And certain configurations are far more important than others. Um, those of you who have seen or heard about, say, perhaps uh, Desargues configurations um, or Desargues theorem, right? So this configuration here is, uh, again, the uh, Desargues configuration. So given by, you take any three blue lines right through some single point, you build these corresponding yellow and green triangles, um, picking whichever ABC you wish. And the question is essentially, uh, when you extend these lines out and consider these intersections, um, if these uh, three intersecting points all lie on the same line, we will call this a Desargues configuration or Desargueasian configuration. If they do not, then this is not a Desargueasian configuration. And why this specific configuration is important um, is because having a certain amount of these appearing on some sets of lines actually informs us about the possible group of automorphisms of the plane, which further tells us there's some sort of algebra hiding underneath that allows you to coordinateize the plane. Uh, another configuration that's of interest is <clears throat> Fano configuration, which is actually uh, the only and the classical really projective plane of order two. So if you built the projective plane as mentioned over F2, um, using the classical construction, you can draw it in a way that will look like this roughly. Um, and so there are no other order two uh, projective planes. Okay, so some quick uh, theorems in regard to uh, configurations. So Ostrom proved that uh, every finite projective plane contains uh, many Desargueasian configurations. He used a clever, uh, just geometric pigeonhole type proof. Um, and so this 
question here, or the fact that he was able to do this is really what drew the inspiration for me uh, uh, and my advisor attempting to answer the question about Papa's configurations, which we'll get to in a second. Um, another big uh, theorem is regarding the number of K arcs in a finite projective plane. So a K arc is just a collection of K points from the plane so that no three of them lie on a single line. Uh, so you can think of right an arc in say R, R2 or R3, right? If you draw any line uh, through that arc, it'll at most hit any two points, right? So, and why this result was really um, interesting and powerful is uh, it actually, uh, for K equals seven, Glenn used this to show that there exists no projective planes of order six, simply by plugging in uh, six into the equation for how many seven arcs should appear in a projective plane of order six. What he got out was a negative number, boom, you know, automatic disproof. So uh, you can see why perhaps looking into configurations might be fairly interesting in terms of this problem or uh, solving the original motivating question. Um, and uh, another result uh, from Tate in 2015 is that any projective plane which admits an orthogonal polarity, which we don't need to go to specifics of the definition, uh, but just discussing some property of the plane um, actually contains Fano configurations. And again, so this original proof from Ostrom is really what inspired the question of does every finite projective plane contain a Papus configuration? So uh, what is a Papus configuration? So let's start with that, right? So if we had a projective plane pi and a line L and a line M, so we pick three points on L, three points on M, and then just draw these lines in the corresponding manner and consider the intersection C1, C2, C3. And again, the total question comes down to, are they collinear? If they are, then we call this a Papus configuration. These configurations are also important because they also tell us a bit about the automorphism group. Um, and so we want to know, you know, do these exist in all finite projective planes? Um, I have had no luck, as have several people that have tried finding some sort of pigeonhole proof. So instead, um, I'll show you guys what I did get in just a quick uh, second here. First, we'll need a few definitions. Um, so a collineation of a projective plane or an automorphism is a just a bijection on a set of points that preserves collinearity, right? So if I map points back to the points, and if I have a line, I want to make sure that applying sigma to every point in that line gives me back another line. And some conditions uh, we can discuss regarding collineations, uh, which will uh, inform, give us another definition in just a second, is um, so we say sigma fixes a point P if sigma of P is equal to P, all right, maps P back to itself. Say sigma fixes a line L if sigma of L equals L. So here, um, right, this is just saying that sigma permutes the points in L, it doesn't have to fix them. But in the case that sigma does fix every point in some specific line L, then we say sigma fixes L pointwise. And in a dual sense, you can say sigma fixes a point P linewise if it fixes P and every line that goes through P. So having this in mind, uh, we get the following definition, so a special type of collineation um, called a VL perspectivity is a collineation that will fix, there is a some specific unique line um, that it fixes pointwise and some specific unique point V, which doesn't have to be on L, that it fixes linewise. So these have, a, this might be a bit of a strange definition, but if we were to discuss affine planes, it's a little more natural. Um, and these collineations actually relate to Desargues theorem in a very strong sort of way. Okay, so what results was I able to obtain? Um, so if my projective plane admits at least one VL perspectivity, then uh, pi has a Papus configuration as a corollary. Um, if I have a finite, so notice, first of all, this theorem has nothing to do with finite or uh, planes. This applies to um, infinite planes as well. Uh, but in the case that I have a finite projective plane of non-square order, then actually every collineation um, turns into a VL perspectivity, ensuring a order two collineation would actually Im imply the existence of Papus configurations. And in fact, all known 
planes of non-square order have even uh, uh, order collineation groups implying the existence of some even uh, or order to collineation. So uh, there's a lot of work being done trying to classify the different um, automorphisms of the different possible planes. And uh, that's uh, uh, we're still trying to see if perhaps there's maybe a plane that has no collineations. That would be very interesting. Um, okay, so finally, uh, I know I didn't define quasi-perspectivity. I'm just going to state the results. So it, a quasi-perspectivity captures the idea of a VL perspectivity, except it's uh, slightly weaker in the sense that it's either a VL perspectivity, so collineation that fixes a line point-wise and a point line-wise, or it fixes a very large subplane. Um, and so in the case that I have a projective plane um, and a collineation, which fixes a very large subplane and it has order three, um, or it's a field perspectivity, right? Both cases are captured by quasi-perspectivity. Then you again find popless configurations. Um, so I won't go over the proof outline. I don't think we have any time. So uh, this is the result I or the lemma I mentioned regarding order two collineations. Um, so uh, the big question that I'm really working on now is whether or not order two uh, quasi-perspectivities necessarily have uh, imply the existence of Papus, which I have not yet been able to get. And more generally, does every does some sort of quasi-perspectivity, whether it has order two or not, imply the existence of a Papus configuration? Um, so uh, references and uh, thank you. Uh, for coming to the talk. Are there any questions? Let's thank our speaker. And yeah, what questions do we have? Um, so there's one in the chat here asking, do I, um, do we know the, how many uh, collineations are there on a, of a finite projective plane of order n? So that answer actually depends on the plane, there are many non-isomorphic planes. So as it uh, happens, um, the largest, so the classical projective planes have the largest group of collineations, but then there are non-classical constructions which will have less. So um, there is a website um, that a math the mathematician Eric Morehouse has, uh, he actually collects a list of all known planes that have been built so far. Um, of various orders. It goes up to like order 25 or 32. So you can look at, and he, he lists all the information regarding possible orders of the collineation groups and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, so there's another question. Does the existence of a, perspe a perspectivity um, count for strong restriction on the plane? Yeah, that's actually a very good question. Um, so it depends on the order. Um, one question in terms of like a conjecture about prime power classical uh, or prime power plane, or rather, sorry, prime order projective planes is that if they have at least one persp uh, perspectivity, then uh, you get the classical plane. So that's a slightly stronger version of that conjecture I mentioned earlier. Um, I believe all known planes actually contain uh, perspectivities. So it's kind of hard to tell how strong of a conjecture um, or a requirement this is, but we don't know. Um, yeah, we're still looking basically for planes. Uh, there is a conjecture regarding, does there exist a projective plane that has zero collineations? So just the identity, um, that would be very interesting. So something very, very rigid that you can't map any line to any other line. Um, and another question here is, uh, do, uh, do you know how many finite projective planes of order n are there? That's also a very big question. Um, again, this number uh, grows rather quickly with n. You can, again, look at Eric Morehouse. So here I can type right down the name. So if you look at his website, um, he has a whole website dedicated to uh, uh, trying to categorize and classify planes. Um, so he's just keeping track of what's known. And so uh, like as of right now, all the known prime order planes are just the classical ones. So just one, but then once you have like order 32, there are uh, thousands and thousands known. So it's, uh, we don't really have an answer depending on it just yet. Yeah. 
Awesome. What other questions are there? Um, I was wondering, so if a projective plane does have a Pappas configuration, does that tell us something about that projective plane? Uh, that's a that's a very good question. That, that's also something we've been um, thinking about. So uh, I can tell you a little bit about uh, if it has more than one, and specifically it has, say, many on a, say, specific set of lines, then that can actually tell you about uh, whether or not there exists these VL perspectivities. Um, and rather, uh, usually people look at um, Desargs configurations. So there is a direct correlation between having Desargs configurations appear constantly on for any, say, pair of triangles on, say, a specific um, uh, pencil, as we say, of lines through a specific point. And if that happens, then you actually can build a collineation, a VL perspectivity and vice versa. So there's an if and only if there. Um, and there's a similar sort of result regarding uh, Papa's configurations. But just to having a single one, uh, we're not sure. Maybe that does tell us something, but uh, there's still a lot of research to be done regarding that. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Let's thank both our speakers again.